Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> the subject on everyone's mind the past month is, of course, the news from Iraq. But I'm not bringing you the news tonight. I'm a philosopher by trade, not a journalist or politician. So it's my job to dig under the news reports and identify the basic principles governing our foreign policy and our citizens, the principles and their long-range results on America. So I ask you, if you will, to please put the war in Iraq aside for half an hour, including whatever estimate of it you have, because I want to stand back and gain some perspective on a whole chain of current events and on the public reaction to them. I want to look not just at Iraq, which is only the latest link in the chain, but at the whole picture of America versus the terrorists in the last 19 plus months. And I want to start back in the 18th century with about 60 seconds on the founding of America, the greatest country in history. Our founding fathers, champions of the Enlightenment and of individual rights, were not only outraged at the abuses suffered from England, they knew that they were absolutely right to be outraged. So they had the immense self-confidence and the moral certainty necessary to declare war against the most powerful empire in the world. The Americans of that era were innocent and benevolent. They were uplifted by the prospect of breaking with the corruption of the past and starting a rational country for the first time in history. And they knew what had always been the top enemy of their new rational world. As Elihu Palmer said, at last men have escaped from, quote, the long and doleful night of religion with its frenzy, these are his words, its fanaticism, its mad enthusiasm, unquote. Now on 9-11-2001, the long and doleful night once more entered the scene of Western history. The frenzy, fanaticism, and mad enthusiasm finally went to war against America with the declared purpose of wiping out everything our country stands for. On some level, President Bush understood the uniqueness of 9-11. He has compared it validly to the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. But 9-11, he has suggested, is worse. And even in purely quantitative terms, he is right about that. 9-11 killed hundreds more people, wounded double the number of Pearl Harbor, and caused massively greater destruction, $40.2 billion worth, not counting all the economic losses it has caused since that date. There is no powerful British empire now for the U.S. to fear. There is no military capability anywhere that would dare to challenge the world's only superpower who everyone knows can squelch any nation or coalition we choose to target. So what has our answer been to 9-11? I want to review some key points since the attack in chronological order. Not just of our government's policies against terrorism, but above all of the American public's response to them, and the comparable policies and response in World War II, which was fought just 60 years ago. My real purpose in discussing foreign policy here is to form a hypothesis about our countrymen today. Who is the American public now? And what do they think about world and moral issues? Are the men answering the opinion polls since 9-11 the posterity of the founding fathers? Is this what is left of the noblest experiment in history? On the day of Pearl Harbor, Americans were stunned and enraged. The next day, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, of whom I am no admirer, gave his short, famous day of infamy speech promising absolute victory over the Japanese. At first, when 9-11 occurred, the country reacted in similar terms, disbelief and rage. There was grief for the victims, admiration for the heroic police and firemen, but above all, there was a desire for self-defense, retaliation, revenge. There was a surge of patriotism. American flags appeared everywhere. The national atmosphere was solemn, tense, funereal. 
Hollywood canceled programs that seemed insensitive. The left was scared stiff and kept silent. There was no more business as usual. The country was gearing up psychologically for a battle of life and death. On September 20th, in the midst of the national fury, President Bush gave his famous speech to Congress. Like Roosevelt, he was seeking to rally and inspire the country. And he too pledged a militant response in the destruction of our enemies. The biggest difference between the speeches, however, is what FDR did not say that Bush, by contrast, insisted upon. Bush's speech is worthy of attention. It foretokens the whole response to terrorism of patriotic Americans ever since. Along with his vows of retaliation, Bush's speech is laced with appeasement. Appeasement of the very nations and institutions that created or feed the terrorist axis. Not to put too fine a point on it, our president sucked up to virtually every enemy in sight. He told us about his gratitude for prayers for us in Arabic, about, quote, the sympathy offered at a mosque in Cairo, about the Pakistanis and Iranians killed in the explosion, about, quote, our many Muslim friends. He boasted that we not only respect Afghanistan, but are currently its largest source of humanitarian aid. He offered his gratitude for support from, quote, the Islamic world, unquote. The terrorists, he stressed, another quote, are a fringe form of Islamic extremism that perverts the peaceful teaching of Islam. We respect your faith, its teachings are good, unquote. Now, Bush, being deeply religious himself, did not even hint at the truth that religiosity is the indispensable background and driving force of 9-11. Everyone knows the role in the anti-American jihad of Islamic faith, from the mosques and seminaries in Iran and Saudi Arabia, all the way to the crazed suicide bombers hurrying to meet their 72 perpetual virgins in paradise. <clears throat> now, I don't need to demonize Islam. The Islamic world enjoyed a high civilization, during the very Middle Ages when Christianity was making the West just about as barbaric as the Middle East is today. The issue is not Islam versus Christianity. <clears throat> Every religion by its nature, by its rejection of reason, is compelled to turn to force and violence ultimately. Every religion is a threat to civilization as soon as it can get its hands on political power, just as Christianity was a threat and a malignant force for a thousand years after Rome fell. So let us grant in principle that Islam is no worse than Christianity, and that there is a large moderate wing within Islam that is not the initiator of the jihads against us. My point is that this is irrelevant to any discussion of 9-11, irrelevant, because even so, Islam is still the enemy. In every war of aggression, there are within the territory of the aggressors a large group of moderate types, in quotes. These are the vast horde of Peter Keatings, or conformists, who initiate nothing but merely watch silently or follow the latest trend. These types would never start any crusade on their own. It is only a small militant minority with access to political power or colluding governments. It is only the activists at the top that initiate atrocities. And this was just as true in Japan in the 40s as in Islam today. In both cases, vast groups of men were innocent of any plans for aggression and wanted to live in peace with the United States. But once the activist leadership has acted, the moderates no longer count in history. They either go along passively, becoming mere ciphers of history, or they come to endorse emotionally what they see their leadership doing. This kind of capitulation is what happened to the people of Japan, and this is what is happening now in the Arab street, where well before the war in Iraq, ever since 9-11, we have seen massive Muslim hatred of America, even among crowds who are not Islamic fundamentalists. Now, if there were a vocal Islamic movement atta uh, attacking the jihad, and championing America's self-defense, 
That would make a big difference here. But to my knowledge, there is no such movement, neither here nor abroad. In a speech declaring war against a vicious enemy who has attacked you, it is a moral crime to distinguish between the active instigators and their passive legions. What you must denounce in such a speech, if you are a proper patriotic leader, is the essence of the threat. Philosophically, on the deepest level, what Bush should have said was some equivalent of the prayer which Maureen Dowd, herself, by the way, a religious woman, saw scrawled on a wall in Washington soon after 9-11. Dear God, save us from the people who believe in you. <laughs> of course, we could hardly expect Bush to say or even think such a thing. But he could at least have said that the enemy was a major and widely popular wing within Islam. Instead, he brazenly pretended that apart from a handful of lunatics, the whole world of Islam was our friend. What would the country have thought of FDR if in his December 8th speech he had expressed gratitude for prayers in Japanese, adulated our many Japanese friends, denounced the bombers as perverters of Shintoism, and classified the attackers as a fringe form of fascism. Do you think Americans would have stood for this in 1941? Or would they have cried out in protest because of the shame to them of displaying such national weakness and cowardice? But what was our country's response to Bush's speech? It went wild with praise. Commentators across the spectrum speaking in an atmosphere of national adulation for Bush. Thank God for having a true leader in such perilous times. In the polls of October 2001, primarily on the basis of this one speech, almost 80% of the country approved of the way Bush was handling foreign affairs. And that is an extraordinarily high figure. The American rage over 9-11 lasted about three weeks as against the angry militant resolve during the long years of World War II. Even as America was going to war in Afghanistan, such as it did, there was a gradual but easy transition in the nation back to psychological business as usual. The canceled shows were cautiously reinstated. The left was noisy, it was normal life again. The public seemed to think it had done its part since it had plastered the flag everywhere. The enemy, after all, Bush had said, is not a major world force, but a mere lunatic fringe. And we must have, in his words, patience for a, quote, long war against it. And who can live with a permanent emergency? Most important and most gruesome, it had now been a month, two months, six months since the bombing. So it was starting to feel to a great many people like mere history. The cries for vengeance died down. The president was in charge. People said, who am I to judge foreign policy? The emotional focus at home changed from rage to grief and praise. Grief for the victims who were methodically eulogized and praise for the domestic heroes of 9-11. Now, of course, it's proper to grieve for victims and admire the courageous heroes who tried to rescue them. But if your country is at war with a mortal enemy, these issues should not be the major focus of your emotion. Your whole passion must be on destroying the enemy. If what dominates you is grief rather than anger, the victims, not their killers, the tragic past, not self-defense and a smashing victory in the future, that is a sure sign of a people starting to withdraw emotionally from the world and give up the battle. Give it up internally. Now, the topic of self-defense brings me to the war in Afghanistan. <clears throat> its essence is contained in the fact that before it even started, the government changed its name. The first code name for this military operation was Infinite Justice. The name was dropped to avoid offending Muslims who were objecting to the name on the ground that only God can mete out infinite justice. I understand, Mr. Rumsfeld, one of the leading hawks, replied. 
America went into Afghanistan filled with ambivalence, uncertainty, and even guilt. Our leadership was afraid of Afghan civilian casualties, afraid of American casualties, and afraid of being hated in the Mideast as infidel imperialists. So they settled on a pitiful proxy war in which we were not combatants but merely advisors. And what we advised was warring tribes open to bribery from all sides, catching prisoners and then letting them escape, often en masse, as in Tora Bora, while the US looked on helplessly wringing its hands. The Americans sent not many soldiers to that war, but a great many expensive bombs and missiles, which achieved numerous and mostly useless holes in the ground. They did not dare population centers, where Al-Qaeda and the Taliban promptly hid out, thereby eluding capture. And along with the bombs, of course, we covered the country with care packages. <clears throat> Was this a war or a charade? A war in self-defense must be fought without self-crippling restrictions placed on our commanders. And it must secure undiluted, unconditional victory as fast as possible, regardless of how many innocent civilians are caught in the line of fire or are deliberate targets of that fire. These innocents suffer and die because of the action of their own government in sponsoring the initiation of force against us. Their fate, therefore, is their government's moral responsibility, not ours. Now, if you want to know what a real war would be, I quote a brief excerpt from a book entitled The Soul of Battle by Victor Davis Hanson. On one day in March 1945, an extreme day granted, but still only one day, and I quote, 334 B-29s left for Tokyo. 500 pound incendiary clusters fell over Tokyo every 50 feet. Within 30 minutes, a 28 mile per hour ground wind sent the flames roaring out of control. Temperatures approached 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. The general in command, Curtis LeMay, wished to destroy completely the material and psychological capital of the Japanese people, I'm still quoting, on the brutal theory that once civilians had tasted what their soldiers had done to others, only then might their murderous armies crack. Over 80,000 Japanese died on that one day. 40,000 were injured. 267,000 buildings were destroyed. One million Japanese were left homeless." Unquote. Now that is how we fought in World War II, and how we deterred future attacks on the United States, and how we wiped out fascism. How do you think the American public in the 40s would have uh, reacted if the war against Japan had been conducted like the war in Afghanistan. Now, I was only a child at the time, but my guess is that there would have been riots in the streets and that FDR would have been impeached. What the war in Afghanistan did is to send a message at that time to the world that the US is a self-made paper tiger to scare no one. <clears throat> In practical terms, all that war really accomplished was to scatter the enemy, including most of its leadership to other countries, mainly Pakistan, leaving the threat to the US from Al Qaeda as bad as ever, which remains true to this day, as even the CIA has stated publicly. The war in Afghanistan was not only a colossal defeat for the world's only superpower, it was a joke. <clears throat> Now, what was the American public's response to this debacle? We won the war, the president and the press said brazenly, and people en masse bought it. They were still passionately for Bush. There was no challenge to his leadership or to his method of waging war, except from the far left, but not from the Republicans in Congress nor from the Democrats. There was a virtual hysteria of patriotism in quotes surrounding Bush at that point, just as there is today. Patriotism seemed to be defined as rally around the leader blindly, seemingly no matter what he does. In effect, to challenge Bush's foreign policy in any way is un-American and almost treasonable. <clears throat> but despite all their excitement, people seemed to realize on some level that the war in Afghanistan had solved nothing. 
Our leaders kept stressing that the problem of terrorism was worldwide, virtually intractable, here to stay for a long, long time. So people felt helpless and afraid. 66% of Americans at that point said that they looked to the future without hope, that they believed life would not be better for their children than it was for them. And I'm sure you, you saw, as I did, you could see it gradually happening all around you. People were slowly giving up on the attempt to eradicate terrorism. They were learning to resign themselves to it, to adjust to it, to accept it as a normal part of life which is here to stay. What lesson did you learn from 9-11? People were asked continually by the press. I read the answer dozens of times. I learned to hug my children. I learned not to take my family for granted. I learned that life is ephemeral and we must enjoy the moment because who knows how long we have. At the time of Pearl Harbor, no such sentiments were voiced. The attitude then was, it is not American lives that are ephemeral, but the lives of the Japanese. And we are going to make damn sure that they are ephemeral, that they're over as fast as possible. <clears throat> A university professor at Columbia University, writing in the New York Times, was elated by the new American sense of helplessness and hopelessness, which he gleefully picked up on. It is, he gloated, quote, a whiff of dread for the land of hope, unquote. <clears throat> now this new dread was metaphysical, not practical. It was the fear and helplessness that people experience, no matter how rich and militarily strong they are, <clears throat> when they renounce the possibility of acting to end a threat and instead accept evil as the normal. So the fact that America is the only superpower had virtually no effect on people. They remained afraid of the rest of the world, even without any practical reason for it. Regarding the war in Iraq, for example, a retired nurse speaking for a large segment of Americans said before it started that she was afraid that, quote, the rest of the world might turn on us if Mr. Bush failed to pursue his goals with patience, unquote. The emotional state of permanent dread is unbearable. So a great many people here simply wanted the terrorist crisis to end, somehow. Many started talking about healing and closure, despite the facts. And many took to stating that after all, there are other concerns beside terrorism to worry about, such as the economy. Confronted by the possibility of the ultimate downfall of Western civilization, Americans in a poll last January, I quote, said they were twice as concerned about the economy as they were about either a pending war in Iraq or the war on terrorism, unquote. That indicates how short range our country has become. Afghanistan was wrong war number one in the fight against terrorism. <clears throat> Obviously, it's proper to retaliate right away against the specific thugs who perpetrated 9-11. But terrorism is an ideological phenomenon. The ideology of Islamic fundamentalism, the ideology of burning religious hatred of secular Western values. And you cannot stop or even wound such a lethal ideology merely by chasing after some of its thugs and their hiding places. To defeat Nazism in World War II, nothing less than a massive assault on its home base, Germany, on the country at the heart of Nazism's support and export was necessary. The same applies to Islamic fundamentalism. And the Germany of Islamic fundamentalism is not Afghanistan or Iraq. It is Iran, as I will discuss shortly. <clears throat> now let's jump to November 2002, when the Republicans surprised the country by winning both houses of Congress. They won, apparently, because of Bush's foreign policy. Despite everything they had seen, a poll taken at the time, quote, showed Republicans beating Democrats by 30 points on the question, which party is tough enough on terrorism, unquote. The Democrats are not tough enough, sure. But the Republicans are on Islamic fundamentalist terrorism? Give me a break. Now, of course, you can say the people are at the mercy of the intellectuals who bear the fundamental blame for the public state of mind. And that's true. 
But the intellectuals are not all powerful. And beyond a certain point, the people, especially in this country, which still has the best people on earth, the people are responsible regardless of what they've been taught. Even non-intellectuals still have their powers as human beings, the power of observation, of thought, and of righteous indignation. If they don't exercise those powers, they cannot be excused, romanticized, or whitewashed. They must be judged morally for their passivity. And this brings me to the present. Wrong war number two, in my opinion, Iraq. <clears throat> the first thing wrong with this war was the six-month-long spectacle which preceded it. The spectacle of the United States on its knees groveling, practically begging enemies, neutrals, friends, everybody in the UN and NATO to approve it. Now, if Bush's argument was correct, and Iraq was a mortal threat to the survival of our country, how could we give up the prerogative to take immediate, unilateral action against it? How could we allow months to go by because of the whims of France? <clears throat> President Bush finally gave up on the UN and came out for unilateral American action while stressing, of course, that it wasn't really unilateral since we had a large coalition with us. <clears throat> But he and Powell hastened to make clear the vital importance of UN approval and of its involvement in Iraq somehow after the war. The implication seems to be that we are not a sovereign state any longer, with the right and the autonomy to defend ourselves, but only a fragment of a world body, over half of which hates us passionately. <clears throat> now, no one dreamed of wheeling and dealing before any international committee in regard to whether it was all right for the U.S. to respond at once to Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Yet Mr. Bush's popularity was still strong this year. As of January, 59% of Americans approved of the way Bush is performing his job. Now in the same poll, believe it or not, 52% of the public said they believed, quote, the government has done all it can be reasonably expected to do to protect the country from future terrorist attacks, unquote. So on Iraq too, it has been follow the leader. <clears throat> and mind you, this is true even though the majority understands that there are grave flaws in our foreign policy. In January, for example, 55% of Americans said the administration was reacting to events as they occurred abroad rather than having a clear foreign policy plan. And yet, despite this, people remain largely happy with the president and what they call his hard nose, in the words of one of his admirers. The country has followed Bush all the way. Observing his deference to the UN, they mimicked it even when he personally was growing impatient. In February, an astounding 59% of Americans said they believed the president should give the UN more time. 63% said that Washington should not act without the support of its allies. And get this one, in March last month, nearly two thirds of the country said that Bush should take into account the views of anti-war protesters before he acted. People wanted world consensus before action. And if you, even, if you need to know even more of the public mind on this issue, people were asked in February about their attitude toward the Iraqi war if substantial Iraqi casualties were involved. That was the word. <clears throat> when faced with this question, the 66% pre-war majority collapsed. The country was evenly split, 46% in favor of the war to 45% against. In other words, a huge number of Americans do not want a war with casualties. <clears throat> An almost identical change from pro-war to even split occurred when people were asked about a war with Iraq if there were substantial American casualties. So on the one hand, Americans claim to believe by a two-to-one majority that the war in Iraq is an issue of national survival against an enemy who can help to annihilate us with unbelievably horrible weapons. Yet on the other hand, these people said, we were not to be in any particular hurry in doing something about it, and certainly there must be no substantial casualties on either side. <clears throat> now the public was and still is following the leader obediently. Two leaders in this case. The state says war, 
And Bush's leader of the church says no casualties. So the American pragmatist on the street says, OK, I accept all of it, everything, whatever I'm told. Who am I to decide on morality or foreign policy? Now let's look at our choice of country to attack at this point in our history. <clears throat> Now let me tell you first where I do agree with the President on this issue. Iraq, as ruled by Saddam Hussein, was a brutal dictatorship and an enemy who had to be stopped. Hussein was ominously armed, and his regime did have some actual ties to the terrorists. I also approve totally of what is called preemptive war. And I agree that it is very much better to wage war on Iraq than to sit on our hands and do nothing at all. But the obvious question in all these very same counts is, why Iraq and not Iran? Iran, as everyone in Washington knows, is the birthplace in 1979 and the center of the modern Muslim fundamentalist movement. That is why Iran has much greater ties with all the terrorist groups than the secular Hussein regime ever did. And why Iran, by the admission of our own State Department, is the worst country in the world in this respect. In other words, it's incomparably more active than Iraq in turning out supporting, arming, and exporting terrorists. Iran, too, is a brutal dictatorship. And it, too, is working feverishly and even more effectively in some respects than Iraq was to stockpile nuclear and other weapons of mass destruction. Even Bush himself included Iran in his axis of evil, along with Iraq and North Korea. But he does nothing to single out Iran as by far our gravest enemy, gravest in the context of the terrorist crisis. Why not? Because Iran is the only religious nation of those three. And Bush does not want to name this fact. In other words, to have to reveal the ideological reason why Iran, Iran is our supreme enemy. Because his whole worldview is tied to the virtue and alleged peacefulness of religion as such of any variety. By the way, if we are short of countries to target militarily, what about such obviously eligible places as Saudi Arabia or Pakistan? both incomparably greater strongholds of terrorism than Iraq. Bush evades all this. He even regards Saudi Arabia and Pakistan as allies. As to Iran, he has told us we need not take any action because we can now count on its civilian student unrest, its internal ferment and possible change on its own. In fact, its pro-Western unrest and ferment, which are real, makes it the obviously logical place for us to have begun to fight. <clears throat> now, I may add that if we had taken on Iran or Saudi Arabia and did so seriously, using all our powers, without restraint, killing its government officials and wiping out the country's terrorist armaments and anti-American agitators, wherever they are, inside mosques or outside them, if we had done that, then Iraq and probably North Korea, too, would have been no further threat to us. Even if left alone, without any war against him, a thug like Saddam Hussein would have run for cover from us if he had believed that the U.S. really meant business in the world, just as he did run as soon as he saw in Baghdad that the U.S. resolve was real. A war against Iraq, however, <clears throat> was the easiest war for Bush to have picked for many reasons. Among them is the fact that the Republicans were eager to erase the black mark of Bush Sr.'s disgraceful flight from Iraq in 1991. But the major reason the choice of Iraq was easy for Mr. Bush is that Iraq under Saddam Hussein was a secular, non-religious country. It was not a bastion of Islam or of fundamentalist hatred. So you could declare war on it without really, mortally, offending or challenging any religious movement, including Islam. In other words, this is the perversity. Precisely because Iraq was not a source or significant supporter of the ideology at the root of 9-11, for that very reason, the Republicans felt morally allowed to wage war on it, and a more real war this time than against the deeply religious Taliban in Afghanistan. By the way, now that the Iraqi war is over, as you are now seeing, the administration has started making noises about Syria. 
another easy target for the same cowardly reason. Another secular thug state without any ideological or Islamic fundamentalist basis. Now a war picked in part because its government is not Islamic will not be too effective in reining in those Islamic governments that nurture and harbor most of the terrorists. It seems obvious that our administration is giving such countries a free pass. <clears throat> now there have been some hints from Hawks in Washington that Iran's turn might yet be coming. The best proposal so far is from Senator Sam Brownbeck of Kansas who wants us to put tens of millions of dollars behind the popular movement in Iran to overthrow the Ayatollah's regime. If this kind of approach ever became administration policy, Bush could still save the world and I would be happy to tear this speech up. <clears throat> but unfortunately so far there is tremendous opposition in Washington to any such policy, which at this point therefore is still only a fantasy. Now an actual fact during the Iraq war I don't know if you know this one, but this happened. American forces deliberately bombed bases of the main armed group of Iranian guerrillas, which had thousands of fighters just inside the Iraqi border aimed against the Ayatollahs. These men were anti-fundamentalism, anti-terrorism, pro the US, and advocates of a secular government in Iran. The press speculates that our attacks on these friends of our cause, and I'm quoting now from the New York Times, quote, were intended as a thank you gesture by the US to the Iranian government for its non-interference in the Iraqi war, unquote. Now I submit that no villain in fiction can beat this action for sheer perverse evil. Now, having picked Iraq for bad reasons, our leaders proceeded to make things worse by stressing over and over that our motives in this war were not only or even primarily our own self-defense. They were also strongly altruistic. The war's code name was not Operation American Safety, but Operation Iraqi Freedom. We fought, we were told, not only to protect the whole world from Saddam, but even more important so that we can shower the lovable Iraqis with everything good. Food, medicine, supplies, individual rights, freedom, a whole new reconstruction at a cost of a hundred billion dollars, you name. And that is what makes self-defense okay as against being merely selfishness on our part. In other words, in this war, we were not even permitted to say too loudly that we are out to save ourselves and our own country. That would be unacceptable egoism. Now, with some notable and glorious exceptions, the conduct of the war largely followed from its stated moral purpose. Now, I'm not talking about the undeniable courage and heroism of our troops, nor about their number, about which I have no opinion, but about the battle orders. The troops were instructed methodically to pull their punches, i.e. to spare Iraq's civilians and its infrastructure, and even more, and I quote, they were instructed, quote, to avoid the kind of fighting that might enrage the Iraqi people, unquote. We are at war against this country, but there must be no fighting that would enrage the people in the country. In pursuing this policy, hundreds of critical high priority Iraqi targets were removed from the attack plan. Massive World War II style attacks directly on urban centers such as Basra or Baghdad were forbidden. Instead, we were given the spectacle of our troops crawling through blinding sandstorms to Baghdad, subject to continual assault and ambush. And in fact, to show you how our troops were hobbled, each military unit in Iraq, try and guess this, had a lawyer attached to it. His function was to vet any decision to target the enemy when there was any risk of civilian casualties. For example, if a mortar launcher was next to a school, the soldiers needed first to get permission from a lawyer before they could take out the launcher, even if such delay involved some risk to their own lives. If they didn't get the permission, they were told that they could be prosecuted for war crimes should any Iraqi civilian be hurt. Meanwhile, Iraq's gleeful policy and response was to deploy civilian shields everywhere, including in schools and hospitals to disguise soldiers in civilian clothes, to dress an army officer as a taxi driver and force him to drive out as a suicide bomber, 
to use ambulances to carry troops dressed in white coats who suddenly start shooting at vulnerable Americans, made vulnerable as a matter of policy by their own leadership. One US commander in the field stated the situation as follows. This war, he said early on, is, quote, asymmetrical warfare. Asymmetrical warfare. I continue the quote. The Iraqis are blasting away, knowing that for moral reasons, the Americans can't, unquote. Our policy, in other words, was known to be emboldening the enemy, prolonging battles, and endangering American troops. The number of our casualties, thankfully, was small. But the horror is that many of our injuries and deaths were utterly unnecessary, the results of our own policies. The Pentagon was actually struggling with an obscene question. How many needless American deaths should it allow? Or as the, a New York Times writer put it during the war, quote, the military must struggle with the deadly calculus of how many casualties it is willing to incur among its own forces to save civilian lives, unquote. Now, we are speaking here of the injury or death of courageous American boys, hundreds of them, many of whom set aside jobs or college plans in order, so they thought, to fight for American liberty. And I say that even one of these boys' lives deliberately imperiled by our so-called moral policy is an act of immorality, is in fact a moral atrocity. It is literally turning our soldiers into sacrificial offerings. But Mr. Bush has no problem with this, apparently. Americans, he has said approvingly, know how to, quote, sacrifice for the liberty of strangers, unquote. Now, thankfully, the Pentagon did not adhere to this sacrificial policy consistently. <clears throat> In the battle for Baghdad, there was less concern with civilians and more commitment to decisive military action which is what made this battle, in my opinion, the most impressive American success story in the war, and finally collapsed the Hussein government. The stated American goal to shock and awe the enemy worked in Baghdad after two weeks of failing. Unfortunately, this feat did nothing to change our basic policy. Time and again thereafter, our troops were made vulnerable without any military reason. As just one example, when gunfire was aimed at our Marines from a mosque, they were forbidden to bomb or even enter the place aggressively. They were reduced to what the press calls fierce fighting, firing from the outside to defend themselves against entrenched, protected Iraqis. The result was one American Marine dead and 22 wounded, senselessly because such carnage could easily have been prevented. We won the Iraqi war as quickly as we did, despite our restrained and even self-sabotaging policies, because it was a lopsided contest from the start, which it would have been virtually impossible for us to lose. On one side, the superpower with all its technological might, and on the other, a third world pipsqueak not yet even recovered militarily from its defeat in 91. What is disturbing, however, is the amount of, quote, fierce fighting such a contemptible pipsqueak could put up against us because we allowed it to happen. <clears throat> a retired general who served in the first Gulf War predicted that the, I'm quoting now, the difficult first two weeks of the war, even though he said we will prevail, but he said that the difficult first two weeks would harm the nation standing as a military force. Here's a direct quote from the general. What's troublesome is the loss of deterrent value. A month ago, everybody in the world looked at the U.S. military as being 10 feet tall. We're not 10 feet tall, unquote. Now, although I'm certainly no military or geopolitical expert, I personally think that after Baghdad, the general statement goes a bit too far. This war, for all its flaws, will serve, I think, as some degree of deterrent, as at least a partial or temporary deterrent helping to prevent aggressive actions against us by hostile governments in the Mideast and elsewhere. So we have caused some fear in our enemies, although nothing like the total fear and absolute deterrence a World War II-style war would have produced. We have shown again that American power is supreme, but that we are still morally unsure of our right 
fully to use it. So we leave open to the world the questions. Will the U.S. use its power after the next provocation? And if so, how seriously? So long as these questions remain open, we remain vulnerable. Our enemies who passionately hate us will probably leave us alone for a while, but they are not crushed. They are not paralyzed by fear. They are not convinced that jihad against us is simply unthinkable. So who knows if and how they will rally and attack us again next month or next year, once the Iraqi war has faded into history. Let us say at the most optimistic that after Iraq, we are not a paper tiger anymore, but an uncertain, erratic, and contradictory tiger who may or may not bite if hit again, as in 9-11. If the president were to keep our troops in Iraq, using it as a perfectly positioned staging ground in a campaign against a real terrorist nation, that would send the world an unequivocal message. But he's told us repeatedly that as soon as there is a new government in Iraq, our forces will leave the country. On the other hand, the Pentagon has announced that they want to keep permanent access to air bases in Iraq to back up possible future action in the Mideast. Administration policy clearly is still not decided. In the last few days, I've seen some good statements, even one good action by the administration. They have called Syria, which is a major terrorist supporter, a rogue state, and cut off an important oil pipeline from Iraq to Syria. But here again, as I've already indicated to you, they're talking about another secular state like Iraq rather than a true fundamentalist ideological enemy. And again, their avowed purpose is pure altruism. The justification they are offering, if we ever do anything, is not going to be American self-defense, but, quote from the administration, Syria occupies Lebanon, unquote. And even on this weak and misguided basis, senior administration officials have rushed to declare that people are misunderstanding the U.S. intentions since the Iraqi war, and that we must press America's advantage, quote, without sounding threatening, unquote, to anyone, including Syria. So what does it all mean for the future of U.S. military action? Does it mean anything? Who knows? If Bush now stood up and said righteously, not just to Syria, but to the whole Middle East, don't mess with us or our interests or our friends anymore, or else we will treat you as another Iraq, if he said that, that would be meaningful and unequivocal. But instead, he has already agreed to pressure Israel into more concessions to the Palestinians in order, as the Times puts it, quote, to placate anti-American sentiments in the Arab world, unquote. In other words, so far, it seems to be contradiction, lack of direction, and even appeasement as usual. As to our future in Iraq, we can already know some of what is in store for our forces not only festering guerrilla warfare by hostile Iraqis and others. Did you know that after a year, there are still U.S. combat missions going in six different provinces in Afghanistan? Not only guerrilla war, but even worse, the hopeless task of putting together the several warring tribes in Iraq and the dozens of clashing exile groups and all the power-seeking UN agencies in order to make out of this hash a new, stable, quote, democratic government. And supposing we did somehow achieve this impossible feat, how long do you think it would be before the new democracy voted to turn itself into another Islamic fundamentalist state? That is all I have to say tonight about the war in Iraq. Now, what about our nation's reaction to the war? The public is euphoric, flush with victory. Despite everything wrong with the war, despite being the wrong war with the wrong goal, embracing some very wrong policies based on a wrong moral code, despite all of it, 79% of Americans, according to the latest poll, said that they remained unshaken in their support of Bush's war policies. A typical case is a lady from Spokane, Washington, an account manager for a financial company, who declared recently that she has trusted President Bush 
quote, to do the right thing, unquote, ever since 9-11. And as to the war in Iraq, she said, quote, it has got to be done and I will support whatever President Bush does, unquote. And by the way, believe it or not, a majority, 62% of Americans, now believe that the nation is winning the war on terrorism. 62%. Now you talk about the emotion of the moment warping objective thought and judgment. Now let us ask for the source of what I can only describe, regretfully, as our passive, unthinking, and too often gutless public. <clears throat> what causes this amoral, follow-the-leader mentality, content to fight an emotionalist, out-of-context spurts, changing its basic view with each new event of the moment, we're lost, no, we've won, etc. My answer in a word is brainwashing, not political, but educational. Brainwashing carried out for decades by the school system. The method is simple. You undercut the ability of the young, generation after generation, to think independently, while at the same time you insinuate into their minds all the doctrines that will destroy basic values kill initiative in political affairs, and paralyze people's capacity for action. You end up with a nation of sheep. Now, I repeat what I said earlier. A man bears some of the responsibility if he succumbs to this brainwashing. And the proof is that many Americans have not yet succumbed to it. But tragically, the majority, I believe, have succumbed. The single greatest destroyer in this context has been progressive education which in various forms still dominates the U.S. from kindergarten through graduate school. Young intelligences who desperately need guidance if they are to develop their intellectual ca capacities are taught routinely that there are no objective facts, no principles, no absolutes, no certainty, and no philosophy to give them long-range direction. They are taught that there is no alternative, therefore, but to act as pragmatists, to treat any problem short-range on its own terms out of context, and to cope with it by doing whatever feels good and seems to work for now, given the social or world consensus of the moment. And as to tomorrow they feel, who can know? Now, what can possibly result from such training? Training in disregarding reality, abandoning thought in favor of feeling, and adapting to the group. What can possibly result but the atrophy of individual self-confidence and of intellectual activity? And to the extent that a person then sees himself as a helpless being caught in an unknowable flux, how can he act except by the guidance of an authority, political or otherwise? An authority which will lift the impossible responsibility of judgment, decision and action from his shoulders and tell him in any confusing situation how things stand, what to feel and what must be done. But the catch here is that our own leadership by this time has had the very same education. So it's the pragmatist leading the pragmatist. <clears throat> Washington and with it the country are immersed in the flow of momentary concretes, staring at single trees with no interest in or even idea of a forest. At one moment the government thinks we must capture Osama above all. At the next the president tells us coolly that one man is not important. The public response, well, okay, maybe it's a change, but there are no absolutes. At one moment, we're told Al-Qaeda is the enemy we must go after and root out. At the next, a single one of its arms suppliers, out of dozens, is the real enemy to smash. And anyway, what about the oppressed Iraqis? And the public responds, okay, if that's today's crisis, but let's not antagonize the world consensus. <clears throat> At one moment, in a given month, the market is down or unemployment is up, <clears throat> so the economy seems to the public to be the most important issue facing them. Who can know the long-range future of the world anyway, people ask. What I do know is that right now, I'm out of a job. Now, the other part of the brainwashing. <clears throat> As you're creating a mental void in the nation, you simultaneously fill it with moral corruption of a kind which will mute or stifle self-assertion on the part of the citizenry. In this connection, the altruism of Bush's policies long prepared in the schools and churches and entrenched even further by the war in Iraq, is crucial. Whatever the government does, 
if it throws billions away on humanitarian largesse to the enemy, or creates nightmare chaos at the airports, or piles up American casualties in the name of liberating the foreign oppressed. People tend to accept, they don't complain too much, because they know it's their duty not to be selfish, but to serve others and sacrifice. Part of altruism, of course, is forgiveness and mercy, which God commands. And God, of course, for the conservative and patriotic wing of the country, is the biggest authority of all. <clears throat> so we must now not merely preach piety, as in the old <clears throat> World War II days, but actually obey the Lord in action. We must fight New Testament wars with battle plans taken from the Sermon on the Mount, following principles defined 2,000 years ago by a sect that was waiting for the world to come to an end and couldn't care less what happened during this life. Do you see how much more Christian, in other words, how much more faith-directed, how much less reason-directed our public has become in just 60 years? Now, beside the helplessly obedient skeptic and the obediently helpless Christian, <clears throat> there are many corrupt and paralyzing ideas circulating in our country. As just one more example, think of multiculturalism which is an assault on our national self-esteem and initiative of unprecedented proportions. Are we any better, many educated Americans today ask, than the cultures that hate us? Don't they have a right to their ideas and values too? Do you see how we can be the world's only superpower and nevertheless be unable properly to fight our enemies? Fearsome weaponry is of no value if the man with his finger on the button cannot bring himself or his countrymen to make the decision to push it. Now at the start of this country, men who had been brought up to think independently and to act long range, according to the principle of pursuing their own happiness, these men could unite and go to war in a passionate cause. Just think of it. These men fought a righteous bloody rebellion against such relatively small evils as attacks on tea or on stamps while their posterity today, not all, but a frightening number of them, facing cataclysmic threats, sits befuddled and becalmed, making only sporadic forays here and there without context or overall plan when the government tells them to do it. That is what I mean by the title of my talk, America versus Americans. In other words, versus a great number of today's Americans. Today we need something even more important than the right war. We need the route that will make it possible for us to do whatever is necessary in our own self-defense and to do it righteously without any moral qualms. In other words, we need an ideological war against all of the doctrines that are confusing and paralyzing this nation. The Arabs, and I'm quoting now from Stephen Cohen, a Middle East specialist, quote, the Arabs understand that this war is happening at two levels on the ground in Iraq, and then an ideological war once the ground war is over, unquote. The Arabs know the real issue, do we? Well, we at the Ayn Rand Institute are doing what we can to spread some better ideas. Dr. Jerome Brook alone, its executive director, I asked him for these figures, in the last six months has been interviewed on over 60 radio and television programs and in the press, and in addition, has given over 30 speeches to groups large and small trying to get the word out. But of course, no one man or institute can change the world. Some people say that the next terrorist atrocity on American soil will make a difference and finally wake up the public. I hope so. But I fear that without the right philosophic ideas, the next atrocity too, however monstrous, will probably in the long run change very little in our policies. The tragedy is that America is so vulnerable when it would be so easy for it to become triumphantly secure. There is still time to change our direction, but not a lot of time. History is not infinitely elastic. So I appeal to you in conclusion, if you can contribute anything to a revolution of ideas in this country, a revolution that will oust the establishment ideology and recreate a rational public. Now is the time to become a philosophic hero and to do it on whatever scale is open to you. If you can make enough of your countrymen start to think, America can still be saved. Thank you very much.